Hello. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Before we begin, uh, we are recommending that you would, um, that attendance adjust to Zoom settings. Um, if you wouldn't mind, please go to the upper right menu and select speaker view and go to the upper center menu and select side-by-side -side mode. Please note that this presentation will be recorded and it will be available through a link on our website and it will be on, that'll take you to, to YouTube and you can, you can watch it for reference in the future if you'd like. Welcome, I'm Eric Jacoby, the president of UCFA, the Utah Center for Architecture. And the mission of the Utah Center for Architecture is to create a dialogue um, with the community about architecture, the built environment and design through uh, several initiatives, uh, which include that UCFA hosts Architecture Week in April. And as you know, that was postponed because of the, the pandemic. Uh, UCA, sorry, UCFA maintains the Utah Architects Project, which is an online database of history about architects in Utah. UCFA facilitates the ECTA program, which is el educating elementary children through architecture. And that program culminates in the Box City presentation, which is normally part of Architecture Week. We also facilitate the Elizabeth Mitchell Travel Grant, which is the focus of tonight's um, event. So thanks again for joining us and um, we'll show you what we've been up to with the grant. Um, the grant program is for Utah's emerging and recently licensed architects. And the $2,000 grant is designed to enable those um, early in their careers to expand their understanding of design by experiencing and studying architectural solutions in other places. Tonight, we'll be hearing from the first grant recipient, Zahra Hassanapur. Uh, but before we hear from Zahra, um, we're excited to announce the winner of the 2020 travel grant. Uh, so our first guest tonight is Bob Herman, the design director for EDA Architects and the fellow of AIA. Bob was this year's chair of the Elizabeth Mitchell Travel Grant Jury. Bob, thank you so much for chairing the jury and for your time this evening. Um, will you please tell us a little bit about the selection process and the proposals <clears throat> for this year's applicants? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Eric. Uh, yes, I'm Bob Herman, and uh, I'm speaking for myself and the members of this year's juries. Jury, we were all honored and excited to have the opportunity to participate in the selection of the 2020 Elizabeth Mitchell Travel Grant recipient. So joining me on the jury this year uh, were Cord Bowen, who's an associate professor at the University of Utah School of Architecture, as well as director of the school's multidisciplinary design uh, program, as well as uh, Robin Carbaugh, an urban planner uh, and president of Carbaugh Associates. A little about some of the thought process that went into the selection of this year's uh, 2020 um, grant recipient. We considered the following criteria. One is whether the project's purpose was relevant to environmental design issues found locally here in Utah. And would it be meaningful and interesting to not only design professionals and those people that work within the environmental design arena, but also something that would be interesting and meaningful to the general public? We, would, we looked at uh, the project scope, its plan, and the methods that were uh, outlined uh, for us to achieve the anticipated outcomes described in each application. And then finally, was there a really a compelling need for this work and research as it influences design here in Utah? UCF, UCFA uh, and the jury received four excellent proposals. And these considered a range of environmental issues uh, from climate change to identity of place, as well as from the impact of perception on the values in, in environmental design to down to the cultural and physical qualities of Turin, Italy. Um, these proposals, uh, as, as indicated by each of the applicants, would have taken them to places like Savannah and Charleston here in the United States, as well as to cities in Netherlands and in the Netherlands and Italy. 
Obviously, these travelers uh, would come back here to Utah with the hope of sharing that research uh, as we're going to hear uh, later in tonight's programs and the findings of that, which we hope will continue to resonate uh, here in the state and uh, with all of the environmental designers here. Eric? Thanks, Bob. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce Elizabeth Mitchell. Elizabeth served as AIA Utah's executive director from 1990 to 2011 for all the ways in which she advanced the profession at the local, state, regional, and national level, she was awarded the honorary AIA designation in 2007, which is the highest award given to non-architects by the Institute. During her final two years with AIA Utah, she worked with uh, the board to revive and reimagine its nonprofit foundation, now the Utah Center for Architecture. She served on UCFA's board until 2017 and has continued to support our efforts. Um, a few years ago, members and friends of the AIA Utah came together to recognize Elizabeth Mitchell by creating a fund in her name. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the travel grant and then if you uh, could please announce the winner of the 2020 Elizabeth Mitchell travel grant. Thank you, Eric. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, when I retired, the AIA Utah board and without my knowledge, raised a sum of money for a scholarship in my name. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to shape its purpose. After a lot of thought, I proposed a travel grant for you, architect, and we travel 15 countries and all but three states in the U.S., and I hope to experience more. In 2018, we created the structure for the program. Those involved were all young architects and planners, including Heather Landvater, Rosemary Stum, David Cawford, Ms. Melissa Williams, plus UCFA board member Julie Addig from Reed League. My notion was to provide an opportunity for those between graduate school and licensure to experience architecture in other very different places, to get out of Dodge, so to speak. I still carried around in my head my initial impression of Utah when I moved here in 1983, that it was something of an insular place. Even if that was a little true at the time, it really isn't now. I mean, post-Olympics, post-flattening of the world through digital technology, and with students in architecture studying here from all over the world, not to mention the travel more and more of us do, normally anyway. In addition, students now study world architecture at the U. They can visit places to some extent virtually and follow trends through online publications. These provide context and impressions, but are not substitutes for researching on site in the place itself with questions in mind. That's how deeper insights emerge. Uh, Bob alluded to the criteria of the travel grant program. I, I wanna underscore two aspects because they are unique to this program and I think make it especially valuable. One is that we require that each recipient have a mentor. It should be someone with knowledge of the location or the research topic who will offer feedback, advice, and support. Second, we wanted it relevant to design in Utah. The project description that the participant, potential participant must identify, it uh, identifies how it will address the architectural issue here, and the recipient must give a presentation to the profession and the public afterwards. And you'll hear more about additional documentation of results later in this program. I think this program structure sets up the greatest promise for success and relevancy. And I hope those of you attending today who are eligible to apply will do so. Before I announce this year's winner, I want to acknowledge Eric Jacoby and Julie Attig for pulling off this program in a year that is so difficult in every way. And with that, the 2020 recipient of the Elizabeth Mitchell Travel Grant is Moshte Azani. Congratulations. Pardon me, I wasn't, I wasn't unmuted, let me start over. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and, and a big congratulations to Majde. Um, really looking forward to hearing about your travels to the Netherlands. I think it sounds like a really uh, exciting investigation. 
Um, please note that your, uh, your window for travel has been extended to a 24 month period, just to, to leave some room for planning around the pandemic. And UCFA will follow up with you um, soon after this presentation to work out the details of your award. So big congratulations. Um, now I wanna to move to the next stage of this presentation. Um, I'm pleased to invite Zahra Hassanapour to tell us about her recent travels to Singapore to study biophilic design, specifically the methods used in Singapore uh, for incorporating nature in the built environment. Uh, and then after Zahra's presentation, please stay tuned. There'll be a short panel discussion about biophilic design, which will be facilitated by another UCFA board member, Balache Ganesan. Uh, Balache is a lighting designer and associate principal of lighting design at Spectrum Engineers. And um, Elizabeth mentioned the criteria for having a mentor on the travel grant and Balache has provided the, the mentorship to Zahra about her travels and studies. Um, so Zahra, without further ado, will you please tell us about your travels? Thanks, Eric. And, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, thanks Utah Center for Architecture and um, Elizabeth Mitchell to provide this amazing opportunity. I was able to travel to Singapore last year. I'm not gonna take too much time. I'm gonna turn off my video and share my screen. Um, just a second here, okay. Um, all right, I hope everyone can see my screen right here. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, so we all know the planet has urbanized and is continuing to do so as a dizzying pace. Cities have absorbed nearly two thirds of the population explosion since the Second World War. They will account for all future world population growth, which, is, which was expected to reach 10 billion in 2050 before the pandemic happened. And the numbers are changing right now. Uh, population growth uh, in the greater Salt Lake area um, was not, no exception to this. And it is um, expected to grow up approximately 50% in the next 20 years. As a result of the urban life, and like the photos that you see on the screen, we now spend more time in urban areas and indoors away from the nature than ever before. With all the new construction and expansion of the built environment, we're also destroying the nature and the species around us. Biophilia means love for nature. Biophilic city is an innovative way of design by incorporation of nature in every aspect of life. Uh, we co-evolve uh, with nature, and so we need it in our everyday life. It's a term popularized by Edward O. Wilson in his book, Biophilia, uh, which he described um, as an in innate affinity that human beings have with nature. The biophilic city, therefore, brings landscaping both into and onto the buildings, walls, roads, um, <laughs> and to bring nature into every element of the built environment. Biophilia is the humankind's innate biological connection with nature. It helps explain uh, why crackling fire and crashing waves captivate us, why a garden view can enhance our creativity. Biophilia may also help explain why some urban parks and buildings are preferred over the others. Biophilic design can reduce stress improve cognitive function and creativity, improve our uh, well-being and expedite healing. And um, as I mentioned, the board population continues to urbanize. These qualities are even more important today. Given how quickly an experience of nature can elicit a restorative response, and the fact that US businesses squander billions of dollars each year and lost productivity due to stress-related illnesses, Design uh, that reconnects us with nature is essential for uh, providing people opportunities to live and work in healthy places and spaces with less stress and greater overall health and well being. For decades, researchers, scientists, and design practitioners have been working to define aspects of nature that 
most impact our satisfaction with the built environment. But how do we um, move from research to application in a manner that effectively enhances health and well-being? Um, Singapore is a good example and is one of the many, I mean, the few examples of biophilic urbanism where the development of green areas and green buildings are being shown as regenerating the natural system in the city and creating an urban ecosystem similar to the original structure, but with better biodiversity outcomes. The importance uh, of the model of Singapore is that many of the other Asian cities are now beginning to copy their approach and enable uh, their dense um, urbanity to be expressed in more natural way. The fact that Singapore has achieved this um, in the past 20, 30 years is a tribute to their commitment to innovation in urban planning. They have demonstrated that planning regulations and planning strategies for biophilic urbanism can be delivered cost effectively with a strong community support. Demonstration can be quickly mainstreamed, government incentives and R&D are all part of the mix of enabling and innovative change and political leadership drives everything. So while in Singapore, I visited a lot of buildings, urban park, public spaces, uh, but for the sake of time, I will present four of the, um, my favorite projects. Um, and these projects are at different scales. Uh, so we can get a sense of how these things are applied in parks and, and, and different typologies of the building. So we're gonna start with um, the city, the connector, the park connector project. Biophilic city is a way of bringing nature into day, in the daily life of the city dwellers. And although the concept was pretty new uh, years ago when they started to make Singapore a biophilic city, there are a lot of new technologies and precedents today uh, to how incorporate nature in an effective way in everyday life. Greening the city of Singapore started nearly 50 years ago with the concept of garden city, which then changed to a city in the garden. And then they moved beyond that and they wanted to make it a city in the forest. And uh, between 1986 and 2007, um, the and Singapore's vegetation cover increased dramatically. At the city urban level, they introduced park connector project by which um, they started to connect the individual separated green spaces of the city with bridges and canopies and made it possible for people to move from one place and another being in this natural setting. Uh, on the other hand, they were able to bring different species into these green areas and increase the biodiversity. They have over 200 kilometers of park connectors today and they believe uh, this is accessible to everyone and, and, and I mean, they always have this in mind, if something is access accessible, people will use it. So on this map, you can kind of see the um, different parks in the Singapore and how they um, started to uh, connect um, these together. And then on this Google map, also you can see how they have all the information needed for the people to navigate be be between these spaces. Um, these video, It, it is in a um, residential neighborhood, uh, but it's one of those parts that is also connected with the roads and the canopies to the other parts and the other locations. Uh, the next project is the Gardens by the Bay. Garden by the Bay is a nature park spanning um, over 250 acres in the central region of Singapore, adjacent to a marina um, reservoir. Gardens by the Bay was part of the nation's plan uh, to transform its garden city to a city in the garden uh, with the aim of raising the quality of life by enhancing greenery and flora in the city. In this picture, you can see uh, the uh, super tree growth um, cloud forest and flower dome. Um, the new um, iconic um, garden which features some extraordinary natural systems um, built to regenerate a reclaimed foreshore. 
the super tree and, um, and display areas are all designed as an educational feature which show people how natural system and cycles work. The man-made uh, mechanical forest consists of 18 super trees that act as a vertical garden, generating solar power, acting as air venting ducts for nearby conservatories and collecting rainwater. To generate electricity, 11 of the super trees are fitted with solar photovoltaic systems that convert sunlight into energy. Uh, which provides lighting and aid uh, water technology within the conservatories below. Um, here is also a video of the bridges. Um, varying in height between 25 to 50 meters, each super tree features uh, tropical flowers and various ferns climbing across its seal framework. The large canopies also operate as a temperature moderator, absorbing and dispersing heat, as well as providing shelter uh, for the visitors and um, people walking beneath. Bridges and uh, dot skywalk have been erected uh, connecting several of the higher 50 meter super trees, uh, letting visitors stroll between them and view gardens from and different heights. Um, also at night, um, they have a very specific lighting design um, with the music. You can see I made it this because people were talking, but they have, they have all of these entertaining features um, for different um, plan for the different uh, time of the day to provide for the city dwellers and the visitors. The next project is the cloud forest and the flower dome, which replicates the cool moist conditions of, of found in tropical um, mountains um, in that region. Um, it features a 42 meter cloud mountain accessible by an elevator and visitors will be able to descend the mountain via a circular path where a 35 meter waterfall provides a visitor with refreshing cool air. Here are some um, of the photos from the inside of the um, cloud forest and the flower dome and you can see and the ramps and um, um, pathways um, used and there over thousands of different um, plants and flower were used um, in these um, forests and they have all these educational installations for the kids and adults to learn more about the environment. And the next project, um, which is one of my favorites too, is the Hutek Blood Hospital. Um, we talked about that um, how nature affects people's life. And the belief that plants and gardens are beneficial for sick is more than 1,000 years old. However, Singapore's rapid development and scarce land resources resulted in an um, urban city escape where many people had less interaction with nature. Hospitals uh, became uh, cold at institutional places that focused on efficient care and infection control emphasizing on investing resources to increase the number of beds and high-tech machines to enable healthcare system to be more efficient. Uh, we mentioned er earlier, there is a considerable evidence that um, shows just a few minutes of viewing plants and nature scenes can result in positive psychological changes. Coldness is enhanced and a fear, anger, and sadness are diminished. In Hotek um, Hospital, they used gardens to provide a pleasant environment for a lot of different activities, whether you're a patient spending time with your loved ones um, or families gathered to comfort, comfort one another, and even for the nurses and the doctors to reduce the level of the stress they may experience day by day. Beside, um, beside the gardens and all the green spaces provided, the building itself features a uh, floor uh, to ceiling um, uh, the windows to allow more natural light get in the building, uh, which has positive impact on productivity, health and well-being. The facade system channels wind into the building and the rooftop gardens improve insulation, reduce energy demand for the building and help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They also improve storm water management and reduce runoff um, which help reduce the sewage overflow. 
and the quality of the runoff is also improved as it is filtered through the plants and the soil. Um, so we see it is not only um, a healing environment for patients, uh, it's a better workplace for employees. It, is also, it, it also helps the environment um, by sustainable approaches to minimize energy use and waste and by also bringing a lot of different species and improve the biodiversity of the environment. Um, so and in this video, you can see how one approaches the building on the right is the access to all of most of the clinics on the left as well. Um, and that is just the entrance to the building. Uh, these are some photos um, of the bridges that connect uh, the um, two wing of the building together. Um, and on the left is the um, patient rooms um, and the fins that we talked about, how they channel the wind into the building. Um, these are also some other photos from the courtyards, from the walkways, the corridors, and how this um, connection between the inside and outside is kept throughout the project. And this video shows um, a courtyard on the lowest level. Uh, I'm going to mute it. Um, at this level, they provided the water feature as the sound of the water is calming itself, but there's also an opportunity for people who are waiting there or just having lunch or just um, reading something or just, they just want to go and feed fishes. I fed the fishes and it was, it was a really amazing experience. Uh, so then the last, but then not the least, and um, this is also another um, one of my favorite projects. And we were lucky that the airport was just open two months before we traveled to Singapore. The um, 1. 1.46 uh, million square feet, it, this is a multi-use complex designed to connect three of Changi's um, airport four terminals. Um, at a cost of $1.25 billion um, and designed by renowned architect Moshe Safdi. Um, it has 10 stories, five above the ground and five in the basement. The star attraction, as you can see in the image, is the 40 meter tall, um, about 130 feet um, rain vortex, uh, which cascades through a huge um, oculus in the middle of the jewel and is built as the world's uh, tallest indoor waterfall. It's a dramatic sight that's usually heard before it's seen as passengers exit the retail and, and dining zones that wrap around the jewel's outer section and head toward the center, um, where they met with the um, tenderous sound of a waterfall that appears to fall from the sky. Rainwater is collected and it becomes part of the vortex as well. Um, 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 I think Moshe Safdi, in one of his interviews, said that um, they can actually control the volume of the flow below the vortex. They have tanks to collect rainwater so they can recycle it. Uh, where there is an excess of rainwater, it can be used for irrigation of the plants in the forest valley. He also mentioned that, um, I read from his sentence, I wanted to explore a new kind of urban space, a space you go um, you go to as a matter of course, because you need to shop, because you're flying out somewhere, and yet it is a garden. Um, somewhere that says, uh, let's rethink what the public realm is. Let's uh, rethink what, is it, what it is to shop. I think one of the reasons uh, we won the bid was uh, that the other submission looked, at, looked like malls and felt like malls. While this one, you don't think um, of it as a mall because it's a new kind of experience. It makes us rethink what urban centers could be like if we stretch out thinking. Um, in most cities, um, a trip, oh, what happened? All right. Um, and in most cities, a trip to airport for um, the city dollars is um, a, a strange thing. I, I mean, we never traveled to Salt Lake Airport to just see things. 
Um, but um, while we were on the bus traveling to the, going to the airport to catch our flight, um, I saw two families who were taking their kids to the airport. Um, there's a lot to entertain um, kids, to entertain um, people, and there's a, still a lot of installation and parks, which um, you have to pay for it, but they all have educational purposes. Uh, in the pictures, you can see um, different views of um, the jewel on the top. Um, on the right bottom is, is a Starbucks um, in the airport, and uh, the two on the left, um, bottom left, are um, part of a pool of a hotel in the airport. And as you can see, even in that hotel, they kind of brought the greenery um, into it so people can enjoy the water and the flowers all together. Again, um, and like we saw with the, with the trees, um, the vortex, um, I mean, it provides a really amazing sound. It has water, but they also use it in the afternoon to have, you know, some um, shows with the lights. I'm not gonna look at all of this, but we will be looking. So we are urban dwellers. Today, more people living in cities than in the countryside. In coming decades, it, it is projected that 70% of the world's population will live in the cities. With this shift, the need for our designs to reconnect people to an experience of the nature becomes even more important. Biophilic design, therefore, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity for our health and well-being. And there were a lot of buildings that I wanted to talk about. As you walk in the street, as you see on the sidewalk, you, are, you can see all these vegetations that are in there. You always have the connection with the green spaces, and no matter where you are in Singapore. And this was an amazing experience for me. Um, so um, this is the last slide I have. Um, I just wanted to give you some information, like about the architects and things. WOHA is a Singapore-based architecture firm. They have been involved in the design and construction of the buildings we looked at today and a lot of other buildings. The Oceia Hotel in downtown Singapore is a great example of how to incorporate nature and biophilia in a hotel project. Uh, they also designed a, a mixed-use residential um, complex. It's amazing. Um, you can find all of these information on their website. Um, they're a great resource for anyone who would like to learn more about biophilia. Also, and look at uh, Living Building uh, Future website. 
they have a handful of information on biophilic design with a lot of examples of the buildings that are built in the United States. Um, uh, and also, Bell uh, is another great resource if you are looking for more um, projects. Thank you so much, and I'm done. Thank you so much, Zara, for a fantastic presentation, for taking us um, through a visual journey of Singapore and for uh, sharing your illuminating perspectives on Singapore's green urbanism and architecture. Um, my favorite building that you shared, actually, as I shared with you before, is the Kutek Port Hospital. And um, I actually had a wisdom tooth surgery there. And I remember how um, nervous I was before going into that appointment. And those um, large windows uh, with a view out to nature immediately calmed me down. So I completely agree with you and um, we can truly understand the significance of biophilic design. I have a few questions for you today um, in, and hopefully we'll um, expand the discussion. So we've, we've talked about um, how important and significant biophilic design is, but could you tell us what about the other extreme? What are some dangers of hyper urban environments that allow minimal or no access to nature? Uh, so, I mean, on the first slide that I have, um, there were four um, mega cities, a picture of four mega cities, um, Tehran, Bangkok, Tokyo, and Los Angeles. And they kind of look similar. Um, we know that the main cause of the heat island effect and the global warming is from, is from the modification of the land surfaces. Heat from building surfaces, heat from the equipments that we use, like air conditioners, road surfaces, and etc. One way of reducing is is by providing natural settings, trees, flowers, and like the example from the hospital that we looked at, how they use the roof gardens not only as a place for people to gather and use it, but as a way to insulate the building, reduce the runoff, and fill up the water, and then reuse it for other purposes. The other important thing is that um, in these environments, we lose biodiversity and biodiversity boosts ecosystem productivity uh, where each species, no matter how um, big or small, they all have an important role. As, I mean, as you could see in the presentation, um, one of the most important things in Singapore that they wanted to do is that to bring back some of the species that because of you know, the major construction, they left that environment they wanted to bring them back. So that is necessary for us and for the environment, for the plan planet to evolve. On the other side, human communities need nature in and around them to thrive. Um, nature in cities uh, can help people to be physically active and, and that reduces the risk of chronic diseases. Uh, even brief contact with nature um, and provide opportunities for restorative experiences. Uh, nature in our everyday life enhances the strength of and the social tie among uh, neighborhoods by encouraging the use of common spaces. And so I think you kind of lose some of these qualities and um, help make the planet, I mean, contribute to the global warming. So by doing some of these um, small things, um, we can really have a sustainable building, have a sustainable community and um, reduce the amount of heat we're contribu contributing to the environment. Absolutely. Um, another question in the same vein is, um, when you have an environment, how does it condition the way in which inhabitants, they see themselves and their relationship with nature? Um, so I think this could be different for people. Um, but I personally think um, by staying close to nature, we feel more grateful and appreciative of what it has to offer to us. And seeing the wonders of the world outside automatically fosters um, um, within us the urge to protect it. And like breathing in nature gives us you know, a wholesome sensory awareness. When we spend time outdoors, we're more mindful of what we see, what we hear, what we smell, and what what we feel. And um, that's what I think. 
Absolutely. Um, okay, so what about the practical aspects? What are some challenges in embracing biophilia in buildings and cities um, on a very practical note? Um, I mean, I think the profession that we're in is challenging. Um, I would say it takes an effort for us to educate ourselves as designers and then um, our consultants need to do the same thing. Then we have um, to um, distribute this knowledge to our clients and the building users and help them to understand the benefit, if there's any, um, within such environments. Um, then it comes the maintenance of the buildings. Um, and, and I think another important thing with um, this kind of building that we say, okay, this is gonna reduce stress, is that the way we examine the buildings after people get in, sometimes the, I mean, some, a project is done when we're, the, the building is built and people move in. But with this project, I think it is important to um, regularly do the post-occupancy evaluations to see um, if what we thought, what we had as a hypothesis, it's actually working. So it could be, it is um, for sure extra work on our side, um, it's going to be extra time, and it may need more money. Yes, there are a lot of people involved for sure. It's a very collaborative process. Um, would you talk about who are some key players in this? What are some long-term commitments that a client or a city has to make in order to, to achieve biophilia in the city or building? The key players, I think architects, consultants, city planners, scientists, universities, um, research and development and government, governmental agencies. It takes a lot of people, a lot of time uh, to do this. It took Singapore uh, 50 years to plan for things and then to be what they are today. Um, it needs, um, for sure, research. It needs, I mean, it, it would ask us to look at um, different countries, different projects that already have done, um, see what we can learn from them. And then, of course, the localities are different um, and the climates are different, the culture of the people are different, and then see how we can translate some of these knowledge into our um, communities. Um, I think the relationship uh, with the university is also really important. Um, I know that in Singapore, when they started thinking about like maybe 10 years ago, thinking about really making the city a, a garden city, um, they had this connection with the university and they had some courses for the student to go and research on like different creative ways that they can um, find out and then um, use those in planning for the cities, planning for the building and etc. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you again, Zara. That's all the questions I have, and I really appreciated um, your thorough analysis um, of, of the city. Um, thank you again, Zara. I'm gonna hand, I'm gonna hand it over to Eric um, for the rest of, uh, to close the session. Okay, thank you so much to Zahra for your uh, really compelling, super interesting presentation. Um, really fascinating concepts there. Thank you to Valache for facilitating the thoughtful dialogue with Zahra. Thank you to Bob Herman and members of the jury. Thank you to Elizabeth Mitchell for your ongoing support of UCFA. Thank you to the UCFA board members and to AIA Utah for helping to organize and facilitate this event. Uh, congratulations to Mojde. I wish you the best in your travels. And a big thank you to those of you in the community who have joined us th uh, for this presentation. And I have just a couple of notes here um, for, before we close out. Um, so the extended travel period for this year's travel grant recipient has created two modifications to the next cycle of the travel grant. So one, the window of eligibility um, from receiving an MARCH will be extended by one year. So instead of an eight year window from graduation, it will be nine years. And then the second modification is that the next round of applications will occur in January of 2022 with a winter announcement at the 2022 Architecture Week. So stay tuned for that. <clears throat> and then if you'd like to know more about the Elizabeth Mitchell Travel Grant, or if you wanna share this presentation or view it again, 
Um, or if you'd like to learn about other UCFA initiatives, please visit our website. It is utahcfa.org. Um, and also, finally, if you would like to donate to UCFA to support any of our programs, there's also a link to donate on our website. Uh, again, utahcfa.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us and good night.